Howdy, B1 Louder, not Santa Claus. Uh, don't let the beard fool you. And don't let the sunglasses fool you. I'm not trying to hide my identity despite the audio problems we had the last episode. I should have checked, but uh, the real reason behind the sunglasses uh, is that migraines are pretty much a way of life over the last month. Uh, and uh, that's a result of some pretty extensive nerve damage I have. Uh, don't worry, this beast did not cause it. It's heavy, but not that heavy. I uh, use it in a stand. Um, but no, uh, I su suffered nerve damage in an accident a couple of years ago. And every now and then, um, it bites me on the bum or somewhere else um, resulting in a pretty significant curtailment in my guitar like activities so fear not um, plenty of footage in the can of this guitar in action and uh, more than likely uh, it will feature other players at this point in time because I don't think I can actually do it justice um, yeah, anyway, so this episode, not so much electric sex machine, but some more history uh, and a, an excursion, if you like, an exploration into how guitar players found their voice and got so damn loud all of a sudden. See you at the end of the video. It's said that history is written by the victors, and although this quote is attributed to Winston Churchill, I'm pretty sure that he didn't play guitar. However, this is true to some extent when referring to the guitar and its evolution, as it's shrouded in myth, legend, misinterpretation and misinformation. Its evolution is filled with sliding door moments and forgotten heroes of innovation and invention. to uh, you know what we use on stage but it's very very special because if you can see yeah the numbers all go to 11 look right across the board oh. 11 oh, 11 and mostly 11 and amps go up to 10 exactly does that mean it's louder is it any louder well it's one louder isn't it to further explore the instrument's origins in an attempt to dispel some of the common misconceptions about the development of the guitar we know today through a period of time when the guitarist was trying to find his voice and be heard, we must again return to the late 19th century briefly. From 1870 there was an enormous wealth of patents, inventions and improvements that would play a major role in the evolution of the electric guitar. Alexander Graham Bell's telephone in 1875 and Edison's first loudspeaker in 1876 further improved by Ernst Siemens the following year, along with the phonograph and Emil Berliner's carbon button microphone. 1898 saw Oliver Lodge's first moving coil diaphragm speaker, and in 1900 Augustus Stroh patented improvements in violins and other string instruments, and in 1901 improvements in the diaphragms of phonographs, musical instruments, and analogous sound producing, recording and transmitting contrivances, thus extending his initial concept using a conical resonator. His failure to register these patents in the USA would prove extremely costly. As in today's cutthroat climate of startups, intellectual property claims and counterclaims, Self-promotion, celebrity endorsement, and at times the ruthless nature and high finance were all as crucial then as they are these days to succeed and survive, and loyalty was not necessarily an asset. Vaudeville was the mainstream avenue for musical performance, and the talkies would not appear until 1927. With public address systems in their infancy confined to production lines, the megaphone was still the way to command attention. 
The acoustic guitar is a quietly spoken voice and musicians sought ways to be heard within chorus lines and compete with naturally louder brass instruments and unforgiving acoustics. John Dopiera and George Beecham would capitalise on Stroll's mistake not to register his patents in the US, and in 1930, National would release the first resonator instruments. The tricone resonator guitar would be a success and embraced by a legion of Hawaiian-influenced guitarists in particular. The Dopiera beecham partnership would not last long, however, and would descend into controversy, backbiting and lawsuits resulting in Beecham partnering with Rickenbacker, resulting in the first truly electric guitar in 1931, and then the Electro in 1935. To a large extent, the development of the early electric guitar was closely linked to the art of slide, with multi-neck versions soon offered by Rickenbacker, National, Epiphone and Gibson. But in 1935, Gibson would offer the guitarist the Electro Spanish ES150 with its now legendary Charlie Christian pickup. Timing is everything, and when Delbert J. Dickerson decided to make a lap steel and amplifier rather than purchase the more expensive alternative for his daughter, her tutor and star Hawaiian player Sol Hoopy was so impressed he ordered one of each himself. Dickerson soon became the go-to guy in California and this marked the beginnings of what would later become the Magnetone brand. With the popularity of Hawaiian music, combos emerged with split personalities, often playing country music in the earlier part of the week before swapping hats for Hawaiian shirts later in the week. This odd marriage saw the adaptation of the slide into western swing, with such outfits as Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, the undisputed kings of western swing, and the lap steel of Anthony Rocker. The electric guitar, however, still had one major obstacle, which was, of course, the wider rollout of electricity across the country. Whilst Les Paul had experimented with the rail guitar, a glorified diddly bow crafted from a disused two-foot piece of rail track and a dismantled telephone, one of the overlooked heroes in the development of the solid body electric was Jamaican Headley Jones. As a musician, he was inspired by Charlie Christian, but unable to afford to buy a Gibson, built his own solid body in 1940. Whereas Les Paul is credited with this honour, Les's log guitar would not arise until the following year, and his invention would be dismissed by both Epiphone and Gibson as a broomstick with pickups until the early 50s, when Gibson sought to compete with Fender's Telecaster, which was released soon after Paul Bigsby's first solid body in 1948. Once again, we see an explosion of patents and registered trademarks throughout the 50s, some of which still haunt us today. Leo Fender's first foray into the electric guitar was his lap steel guitar, so it's no surprise that whilst courting various country players for feedback, he chose star player Jimmy Bryant to be the recipient of his first Telecaster. Bryant had first come to prominence through his association with Tennessee Ernie Ford. Although a fan of Fender, Bryant was by no means a loyal and exclusive player. One of Bryant's more interesting associations would come with the Stratosphere Twin, built by brothers Russ and Claude Diva from Springfield, Missouri, and heralded as the guitar of tomorrow today. This unique twin neck would only be produced between 1954 and 58. 
in numbers fewer than 200, and it almost stands as a missing link between the lap steel and solid body electric guitar. They were truly custom guitars, all hardware manufactured by Stratosphere. The thing that possibly doomed these guitars to failure and obscurity was also the most appealing and challenging quality of the instrument. Essentially, it required the guitarist to relearn his instrument, with the 12-string neck being tuned in major and minor thirds, rather than the customary octaves and unisons. This tuning is closer to an equivalent of a high-strung Dobro tuning, and sounds similar in many ways to the multi-track experimentations of early Les Paul recordings. Bryant's first instrument was the fiddle, which he abandoned whilst enlisted during the war, and his knowledge of fiddle tunes and love of jazz was of obvious benefit. It was also used by Chet Atkins to record, and Fran Beecher from the Bill Haley and the Comets, and later on by psychedelic rock guitarist Johnny Eccles. With so few made, it is unclear how many still exist. The early models with their distinctive Cadillac grill pickups were made from walnut and maple, and the first guitars had no truss rod and fared poorly. The latter models did, however, and were somewhat more robust. The later guitars were also made from gumwood. As a self-confessed guitar nerd, I can't help wishing the guitar of tomorrow still existed in larger numbers today. It was truly ahead of its time, and in so many ways it deserves more than a place in quirky guitar history. For more information on the Stratosphere Twin, please check the links below in the description. TK Smith, the world's leading authority on this guitar, can tell you more than I will ever know and he can even show you how to play one if you can find one or would like to tune your 12 string guitar to this very interesting tuning. Any panting you may have heard uh, during the making of this video comes from my uh, three-year-old cocker spaniel who finds this subject just as exciting as I do. Hopefully he will be able to contain his excitement in the next episode when we take a deeper dive into the world of the electric sex machine and concentrate on the guitar itself. For now, happy trails and uh, see you soon. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and don't keep your friends in the dark. Share the love and by all means, comment or drop me a line.